Welcome back everybody to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name... Enough. Much better. Welcome back everybody to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. Today I'd like to talk about a topic that's very important that we've touched on before as I've been talking about these vintage rings, but that is recutting. And as I was going through a parcel of stones that was having recut for this specific purpose, I realized that there were a lot of teachable moments, so I wanted to lay those out for you. You're welcome. There are a number of thoughts that everybody who is getting into the gemstone world will have to think about at some point. If I'm not buying new gemstones, but instead finding old, valuable gemstones, what do I need to know? Because at the end of the day, we have to recognize that gemstones are older than humanity. So that which was, unless it's been destroyed, still is, in some way, shape, or form. And some of those gemstones from yesteryear were cut in a way that's maybe less than attractive. Or they've been loved so well that they're now a little bit, uh, you know, crispy and crunchy in need of a little TLC. So how does that work? So in the case of vintage jewelry, like we're working with right now, we sometimes have a beautiful mounting that we still like, we think the style is great, but we find out that the gemstone is synthetic. So in order to upgrade that stone, we pop out that synthetic stone, throw it away because we don't care about it, and we find a natural stone that appeals to us. But the problem therein is getting that stone to fit the mounting perfectly. Most gemstones are not cut in a cookie cutter kind of way, so each setting may have its own different quirks. So as we talked about in a previous video, we have to measure the setting very carefully and also get to understand those mountings as well as we possibly can. The more we know about how jewelry is manufactured, the easier it is to actually get a stone that fits it perfectly. So once we have measured the stone and examined the setting well enough and we're satisfied that we know the size of stone that we need, then what we can do is take an older stone from somebody else's collection and get it recut to fit our mounting. And really that's not so hard. But there are a few caveats that you need to be aware of. The first is when you're communicating with your lapidary, you need to be excruciatingly clear with what you want. And so that's dimensions, length and width, as well as the depth. Each gemstone has its unique properties. And one of those properties is the refractive index. And that affects how a gemstone is cut. Something like emerald or aquamarine, which is the barrel family, they have a lower RI. And because of that, the gemstone needs to be cut with certain angles that mean it needs to be a little bit deeper. Other gemstones that have higher refractive indices like corundum, ruby sapphire, or diamond can be cut more shallowly because the angles that they need to be cut for light to reflect back to you properly are different from emerald and aquamarine, the barrel family. So without getting into that too much, just be aware that different stones need to be cut to different sizes simply because of their properties, assuming that they're cut properly, of course. If we don't cut them properly, then we end up with problems like window or extinction. But window, I would say, is more perilous than extinction. That's my personal opinion, mind you, but anyhow. If you want to learn more about window, go watch that video. So when we're communicating with the lapidary, we need to have our dimensions and be very clear about how we want the stone to be cut. And that also includes, to some degree, the fastening pattern. If you want to give the lapidary license and freedom on creative decisions for your fastening pattern, you can do that, but you're rolling the dice. Just like with cooks, you have some people that consider themselves artists and you have some people that just consider themselves technicians. Some people really don't want to make decisions for you. They just want to give you what you want and do that perfectly. These people are wonderful. We love them. But that means that you need to make up your mind. What do you want? So if you want a round stone with these dimensions, great. Which fastening pattern do you want? Very common with colored stones is a brilliant cut top with a step cut bottom. It can preserve a lot of weight, give you the best color and scintillation. But if I don't tell them that I want a step cut bottom, then they may end up giving me something like the flower cut or Portuguese cut. That works for some stones, it doesn't work for others, and that's just an aesthetic choice. What do you think looks more attractive? So again, that's up to you. Some people prefer brilliant cutting. I myself do not. With some stones, it works, it looks really nice, but with other stones, it just feels manufactured. Again, that's an aesthetic choice. Highly subjective, but I am right though. 
So anyhow, being very specific with what you want from the lapidary is super important. Just like being a teacher, if you don't tell them that you need to have your homework done on this day at this time and in this capacity and don't forget to write your name at the top, then kids are just not going to do it. Any decisions that you leave open to the lapidary, they will make for you and maybe not in the way that you want. Okay, so let's move on. One of the most common shapes that you will find in the general market is going to be an oval. And why is that? Because ovals preserve a lot of the original crystal. If we start with a gnarled up looking crystal that came out of the river in Sri Lanka, it may have this kind of general shape. In order to get the most weight out of that crystal without making too many decisions for the buyer, they will just cut it into a simple oval shape. Very bulky, give you an idea of what is the color, what is the clarity, takes out a lot of the risk. Because buying rough really is difficult. It takes a lot of experience. And if you don't have that experience, it's better to just buy a fasted stone and recut it. But not everybody really likes ovals. I myself am not a huge fan. So what I can do is get an oval in a size that is close to what I need for my ring or for the piece of jewelry I have in mind, and I can get it recut from there. So I will take some losses in the size of the stone, but the value of the stone could also go up. Maybe there are some inclusions that we can take out with that recutting process. Not to mention better fitting our aesthetic. So if I want to take an oval and turn it into an emerald cut, that might be possible. Maybe it's not. Depends on the shape of that oval. Is it long and skinny? Is it short and stout? Maybe an asher cut would be better, or a trillion. And these kinds of janky ovals are what you are more likely to find in somebody else's collection. So if you're buying old stones from somebody of yesteryear, or a couple of decades ago, or maybe even hundreds of years ago, you may end up having these bulky, nonsensical shapes, but these shapes will give you a lot of potential and space for recutting. So if you prefer those round, brilliant stones, find an oval that is as close as possible to the size that you want in the length and the width and the depth, and just get it recut. And that's actually a perfect point to make right here. Round cut stones are oftentimes more expensive than other shapes, and that's because it's the most inefficient way of cutting a stone for the weight of the crystal. So if we know that we took a crystal that's this big and cut it down in order to make a perfectly symmetrical, round, brilliant stone, then you're still having to pay for that oval because all of that crystal that had to exist in order to have that ideal stone has now been ground down and lost into the dust of time. But the value has not been. And the same thing is true with wise people, right? If you look at someone who really understands the difficult things in life, you know they went through some harrowing adventures. So we try to respect them. At least I hope so. Other things that we keep in mind when dealing with recutting and retrofitting vintage jewelry is maybe that vintage jewelry had an original stone in it. And if you can take out that stone, it's sometimes more convenient just to give that stone to the lapidary and say, match this new material to this old material. They can do their measurements on their own, and they can put that pattern or that size on your new stone. That makes things nice and easy. Otherwise, you might just have a stone that you like the shape, you even like the fasting pattern, but because it's been well-worn and well-loved, it's got some scratches on it. Maybe it's got abraded facets. And those are gonna be those frosty looking areas at the edge of the stone where the two facets meet. Oftentimes in people's collections, especially with dealers, they'll keep the stones together. And if you watched our video on hardness, you will know that stones that are harder than other stones can scratch them, but stones that are the same hardness can also scratch each other. So if you keep 20 aquamarine in the same bag and put it in your pocket and you go jogging, then over time, those are definitely going to have abraded facets, probably some scratches, and they will need a little TLC before they're ready to be sold again. Fortunately, a little bit of a polish doesn't lose too much weight, but if you don't store your gemstones properly or ship them properly, then that is what is likely to happen. You don't want your stones touching each other if at all possible. So in that case with the lapidary, you just tell them, repolish, do not change the fasting design. When dealing with cabochons or something like that, sometimes it's easy to just take a larger cabochon, give them the original stone from the setting and say, match this to this. Same thing, nice and easy. You don't need to do any measuring. They can just eyeball it and then compare. Lay it over top the other one Notice that the background of this one fits perfectly within this one. Okay, this stone can be recut to match this one. Now, something to be aware of when you are buying some of these well-loved or well-worn stones is that they may have chips in them as well. If there are substantial chips in the stone, then you need to be aware of where are those chips. If they are around the girdle line of that gemstone, in order to get those chips out completely, they're going to have to bring in the girdle of the stone, the girdle being that middle portion of the stone. If they have to do that, there will be a more substantial loss of weight. Why? Because the girdle affects 
the crown and the pavilion. So if they have to change the girdle, they have to change everything. So having some minor chips on the crown or on the pavilion in certain places can be acceptable and can be dealt with without losing a whole lot of weight. But if you have chips around the girdle, do be careful. That's the kind of stone that I would just pass on, unless you can get it for a screaming deal. And another thing to be aware of is something that looks like a scratch may indeed be a crack. Cracks or fractures or fissures, depending on what you would like to call them, can be particularly treacherous and difficult to see. Depending on which gem material you are dealing with, they may or may not be highly visible. So a good way to find out, is this a fracture that I need to be worried about, or is it a stone I should just pass on entirely? Get yourself a nice strong torch or flashlight and inspect the stone from many different directions. Sometimes a fracture plane or a fissure will illuminate itself when the light hits it perpendicularly. And that means that you have to be able to rotate the stone well enough to find that fissure and see how far into the stone does it go. Because it may be the kind of thing that this fissure could mean your stone is going to lose more than 30% of its weight. And if that's the case, you're going to be losing a lot of value on the stone. But everybody loves a rags to riches story, so do go out and inspect lots of gemstones, even if you're not gonna buy. The more you see, the wiser you will become. And when you do start to experience and buy and get things recut, you will go through a process of painful learning, but you will also have the satisfaction of seeing something go from a forgotten old pebble into being a modern treasure. Because truly, these gemstones will be around even after I have become dust. You may live forever, I don't know, but I, I expect I would be dust someday. Otherwise, if you want to learn more about gemstones and investing in gemstones and gemology, then head over to gemshepherd.com. You can get in contact with me directly there, and you can also read blogs about gemstones and investing in gemstones. Otherwise, leave me a comment down below, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, tell all of your friends about me, and until next time, bye bye